Right, thank you. Now, in the last session, um, I outlined issues involving in identifying markers for hordes, and I want to take the opportunity to go through that, conclude it uh, in the first part of this session. Just to reiterate, um, I was able to identify 30 hordes or assemblages uh, of the several hundred recorded in the proceedings that are conclusive evidence of being marked. Another 60 or so were almost certainly marked, but the evidence was less conclusive. And with a couple of exceptions, all were Roman or later. <clears throat> now, of those that were conclusively marked, uh, the greater majority used existing natural features, typically large earth fast stones or boulders, which seemed to have acted as both place of concealment and marker. Many occurred in open landscapes where the position of the stone uh, must have been visually significant. Now, among these, pride of place goes to a hoard near Ferso, where coins bound in a small linen bag were discovered in 1876, buried behind a parish boundary stone. This wasn't just any old boundary stone, but one which bordered three different parishes, Bower, Holkirk, and Ferso. The most likely explanation is that the monies may have been buried at this mutually convenient point for ease of transaction. A sort of a click and collect comes to mind to alleviate issues of travel and meeting, but that the payment was never collected. Now, large stones appear to be used as field markers in various instances. In the field in Butte, where ploughing upturned a large stone with coins hidden underneath. A hoard of silver coins was found behind a rock at the edge of a burn in Portree and Sky and 177 coins were found underneath a large stone, which was pulled out during quarrying in Dumfriesia. There's an account of an Ayrshire shepherd walking down a lonely glen in 1882, who felt what he described as a tinkling at his feet, and looking down he saw some silver coins, which seemed to have been washed out from behind a large rock. He eventually recovered no fewer than 142 items. And a similar item, a uh, similar example came to light during tree planting in Loch Orside, Argyll, Gyle, 1870, uh, coins spilling out from under an earth fast stone. Then there was the herd boy in Banff who found some coins, quote, while enjoying himself by a large stone, unquote, whatever that means. He returned with his father to find 202,000 more under the same stone. Uh, several hordes occurred under large stones during quarrying or railway construction, and in one case was accidentally unearthed by the home guard during rifle practice. Now, I should add that Bronze Age material appeared in all three instances, in three instances, buried directly behind or under earthfast stones. One contained six axe heads, and the other two axe heads, the, the other two also axe heads, but with other material as well, including cart mountings. And I'm not sure how these make sense in the broader context of Bronze Age depositions. One hoard of Roman date consisted of a series of bronze containers stacked behind a rock discovered in 1886. Now, inevitably, several hoards were found in domestic environments, under a flag in a cow shed, under a hearthstone, hidden in a hole in a chimney breast, found when a house was being demolished and under the flagged floor of the Provert's house in Aberdeen. <clears throat> a hoard, incidentally, which contained both coins and buttons. Nothing else, that's a strong reminder to, to check your change if you buy anything in Aberdeen. Here we've also got to add famously the Galway hoard, strategically hidden between the inner and outer timber supports at one end of a structure, a type of cavity walling in a pit sealed with sand. And I'm grateful to Dr. Martin Goldberg for discussion on this and for supplying the illustrations on this slide. Now, in areas that possess no clearing banks, these are not unreasonable places to hide one's fortune or loot but few of them possess the concealment potential and animus revertendi opportunity as that provided by ecclesiastical buildings. For example, take Glasgow Cathedral, <clears throat> where an anonymous account 
of some 120 gold coins <coughs> found in 1837 under the floor near the crossing provides exceptional detail. Quote, these coins were found below a flagstone at the northeast corner of the second pillar from the northwest pier of the Great Tower on the northern side of the nave. They were lying among dry sand immediately below the stone with neither bag nor box above them. St. Ronan's Chapel on Iona. A small silver hoard was found during restoration under a stone at the west corner of the base of the south respond of the chapel arch. It was, as A.O. Curl interpreted it, quote, the booty of some thief, hidden with a view to ultimate disposal. That the rascal met his fate and his ill-gotten gains is the obvious conclusion. Elsewhere on Iona, workmen in 1950 discovered a hoard of 350 coins buried adjacent to a Shamford foundation of the abbot's house. The St Ninian's Isle treasure was found by schoolboy Douglas Coots under a crossmark slab in the chapel nave in 1958. Uh, Professor James Graham Campbell has looked at the circumstances of this recovery in some depth and, like me, sees it as a genuine case of X marks the spot, although there is some debate of the level of flooring under which it was found. Finally, in the cathedral green Fortrose, a hoard of over a thousand silver coins was discovered in a small stone kist in part of the old cathedral yard. And the report of 1880 makes for interesting reading. It is a curious fact, I'm quoting now, and probably not a mere coincidence, but indicates the manner in which the concealer of the treasure expected to be guided in searching for it again. That a line drawn down the centre of the nave of the old cathedral, which lay, as usual, east and west, or from corner to corner of the green, would, as near as can be judged, pass through the sight of the find. Further, in the same line, but nearer to the cathedral, there was at one time a mound or tumulus surmounted by a stone and known as the Hole Ridge. The discovery was made halfway, 40 feet from each end, between the Hole Ridge and the boundary of the ancient green. Well, less conclusive, perhaps, are another 60 depositions which were almost certainly marked, but um, not with 100% conviction. I won't bore you with many examples, but they could be divided into two groups. Those which were found in close association with buildings and were probably hidden in a relatively confined space, but without, specific, without a specific identifiable marker. 20 examples of those. And those discovered outside buildings in defined but larger spaces about 40 of those. Now, inside the buildings, those records that I discovered were invariably found during building work or in the excavation of foundations of an existing or earlier building on the same site. Uh, the majority of the hoards consisted of coins contained in a copper or earthen vessel or occasionally a pearly pig, uh, the archetypal container for domestic savings and the forerunner of the piggy bank. Some were found under clay floors, but mostly within or around structural foundations during demolition or rebuilding. None were specifically marked in a manner that had survived. However, the contention must be that any concealment below the confined space of a room would make any separate marking largely superfluous. Corners, specific walls, uh, specific stones in walls, or even the positioning of internal furniture would suffice as a marker. And these hoards were found in urban properties, Glasgow, Edinburgh, and in Aberdeen, where 12,000 coins were said to have been found in a copper pot, as well as in rural locations such as the Wheatsheaf Public House in Eyre in 1863, and even the prison in Dunblane five years later. This group also includes the hoard from the Brock of Berger in Orkney, where the consensus of accounts places the Pictish silver in an undefined position uh, within the, sorry, within a, an undefined position in an abandoned structure on one side of the cells, identified here in Captain Thomas's uh, 1852 plan as the cell denoted as jewels. And I've 
inverted his plan so you can see it better. Petrie, writing in 1859, recorded that the treasure was found, quote, in the thickness of the wall, unquote, and after the building had been reduced to ruins. Now, in discussing all these, I'm mindful of Helena Hamero's work on the deposition of domestic non-precious hoards in settlement contexts, where she's identified depositions which represent the foundation of a building and those which represent closure in which the building had been destroyed, none of which, none of which were intended to be recovered. Her assemblages, which were in a sense ritual assemblages, however, were non-monetary, and I see these as being significantly different. Then we've got 40 locations where the concept of marking a deposition is equally likely, but outdoors with fixed boundaries and in defined spaces or adjacent to a particular feature, which might act as a general topographical marker. And among these are several depositions in churchyards, which appear to relate to walling or gates as general markers, or in areas of the churchyard not used for burials, such as at Rata and Caithness, where a silver hoard was discovered in a small kist, or where 700 coins turned up during the extension of a kirkyard in Moniath. As in many other locations, much of the material from this last hoard vanished before it uh, reached the hands of the procurator fiscal. In this particular instance, the preceding's entry recounts that, quote, before the discovery became generally known, the greater part of the hoard was disposed of by workmen, adding rather disparagingly, who were Irish, unquote. A relatively large number of hoards occurred in features variously described as being in the side of or the base of drains, sewage drains, or ditches. These seem to have been popular places for depositions, presumably acting as a general topographical marker from which the hoard could be hidden and located more specifically by other means. Again, I am mindful of the work of others. There is a long history of deposition within boundaries and enclosure ditches with a strong territorial significance, but again, these tend not to be monetary deposits. Then there were those where the general marker was of an earlier tumulus, a cairn or a structure, and the hoard was either hidden within the feature or adjacent to it. And there are problems of interpretation here, as Roger Bland and his team have pointed out, particularly with antiquarian discoveries and the possibility of secondary burials. Uh, not least the work of Semple, who's argued that prehistoric deposits, notably weapons in these contexts, are votive and indicate the veneration of and respect for earlier monuments over time. Now, that said, I've included among my list of marked burials here depositions such as those at Stennis in Orkney on the basis of Anderson's 1873 account and the Gallcross Hoard hoard. Uh, ridden in the ring cairn of a recumbent stone circle. Norrie's law hoard might be argued similarly. Joseph Anderson reports it was found buried in a patch of sand at the end, edge of a Bronze Age tumulus which was originally surrounded by stones and which was being levelled. It may well be that the tumulus acted as a general marker with a hoard being located more specifically adjacent to one of the surrounding stones. And would the recently discovered hordes at Burnie in Moray also fit this group, argued not as being votive or ceremonial in a special place, but located specifically in relation to the fixed markers of derelict buildings, depending on intervisibility at the time and the degree of concealment from a wider landscape. Helena Hamero, and presumably Fraser Hunter would probably say not. But Helena Hamero's studies on votive depositions in settlements tend to be A, non-precious, and B, limited to one or two items. These differ on both counts. Elsewhere, we have the phenomenon of hordes being discovered near rabbit holes. I am a great believer in the archaeological rabbit and the ability of the modern rabbit 
to construct its warrens in the soft soils and cavities presented by buried archaeological structures and monuments. This was brought home to me working on the Small Isles volume uh, for the then Royal Commission. The three islands of Canna, Merck and Egg all share similar geologies and landscape histories, yet Merck appears much poorer in the historic environment record and less well endowed than the others. Examination of the data shows that many of the recorded sites on Egg and Canna result from the recovery of pottery, particularly prehistoric sherds discovered in rabbit scrapes. Merck has no rabbits, and therefore its archaeological representation is poorer as a result. And this image of Canna indicates the value of rabbits around a partly concealed hut circle. Never thought I'd end up showing images of rabbit holes, but there we are. The scale hoard on Orkney was reported as being found in 1858 by a boy, quote, amusing himself around a rabbit hole, unquote. Anderson's 1874 account of the same incident describes, quote, a boy chasing a rabbit into a hole, unquote, while Petrie's description shortly after itself, after the discovery itself, refers to, quote, a lad sauntering, unquote. Now, Professors James Graham Campbell and David Griffiths have looked into the discovery of the scale hoard in some detail. The earliest evidence is from Petrie, who refers to the ruins of a large building adjacent to the hoard, which might be represented by a building known as the Snoothgar, excavated recently by Griffiths uh, in the immediate locality. Uh, virtually, well, certainly close to the location of the hoard, and evident as a former site on this 1922 Ordnance Survey map. And I'm grateful to David Griffiths for discussing this with me. The position of the hoard itself is open to some interpretation, not least due to the, quote, eager scramble of country folk, unquote, according to Petrie, to find more of it. Then there's a similar discovery uh, made by an eight-year-old boy in Argyle in 1872, also amusing himself in a rabbit hole. And a court hoard of over 270 coins was found in a similar context in Mithlothian, ironically, by a man with the name of Dr. Badger. My contention would be that all these three sites contained buried structural remains, which offered a degree of visibility at the time of the hoard deposition and presented useful contemporary markers for those who knew where they were. And after all that, do we just write off all those many sites without known markers simply because no one bothered to look for them or record them? Or did they actually not have markers in the first place? And if so, what does that mean? Roger Bland's epic volume on Iron Age and Roman coins in Britain is 329 pages long, of which three paragraphs are devoted to markers. Not because his team was disinterested, but because the available evidence was so sparse. So what's the conclusion to all this? Well, on the basis of what I've found, my take would be that where many coins or valuables were concealed in Roman or post-Roman times, locations were selected <coughs> where animus attendi could be enacted using either natural landscape features or markers such as ruined dwellings or man-made features such as drains, ditches, external walls and boundaries. Hordes discovered in domestic environments could be more precisely located. It would be easy to conclude that hordes discovered within the open landscape without identifiable markers were jettisoned in haste or reflect memory loss or were votive but there are just too many of them. Lack of recording may be a major factor as to why they were never recovered. But the lesson is probably one to do with how early landscapes may have been read and our ignorance as to how external space might have been organised and understood in prehistoric times. Now, my hero in this conundrum is the Reverend John Struthers, 
Minister of Preston Pans in 1868. A group of girls had ploughed some, found some coins ploughed up in a field in his parish. On hearing this, the Reverend Struthers took it upon himself to systematically excavate the immediate area, and he discovered a further 100 coins. As far as opinion can be formed, he wrote, the deposit had originally been made simply in the earth or in some bag or friable vessel, of which no traces remain. The Reverend Struthers knew what he was looking for because he added, quote, not even a stone marked the spot, unquote. Thank you, Reverend Struthers, A, for bothering to look for a marker, and B, for telling me there was nothing there. I wish more finders had done the same. Well, I want to leave markers for there and to move on, uh, rather clumsily, I fear, onto another uh, theme that we'll conclude today, and that's the theme of exhumations. Now, so far, I've dealt with effects of time regarding criminal clandestine burials and markers. And I want to now look at this somewhat rarer recovery of legitimate burials, where issues of landscape, memory, and markers uh, don't fully apply. But where there's another interesting relationship between the archaeology of the present and the archaeology of the past. First, a little bit of background. Now, there are rare occasions when a body needs to be formally exhumed after a period of time. This can occur for a variety of reasons, perhaps due to issues with identity or paternity, or maybe because the local council intends to redevelop the cemetery. But the least straightforward ones are those carried out by the police for the purposes of forensic investigation, for which archaeologists are now increasingly being used. Strict rules as to how exhumation should take place are embodied in legislation, as the Burial Act in England, which makes perfectly clear what should be done, the order in which events should occur, and what the formalities are. Among these are the dawn starts and the macabre screening, which harks back to an era of Victorian morbidity. Uh, the image on the screen is of, a, of the police guarding the exhumation of Beryl Evans, one of John Christie's victims at 10 Rillington Place in 1953, mentioned in the first session. Now, in forensic ex exhumations, in my experience, apart from these ghoulish statutory measures, we can add a number of practical realities. The uniformed officers gloomily guarding the cordon, waiting for the sun to come up, the sullen journalists trying to find coffee, and the silent band of black-suited undertakers, solemn-faced, waiting for their slice of action. But early starts are good news for the paparazzi. They can record the chilling images of lights moving busily within the cordon, lights which cast eerie shadows across the gravestones, but what they will not see, and what the general public will not see, is the relative chaos that may be going on behind the screens. Now, before I elucidate further on this, I want to set out a little of the background to the two faces of our cultural encounter with death. On the one hand, we have the dignity and solemnity of bereavement with all its trappings of ritual. This is what people see and what they expect to see. And on the other are the practicalities involved with disposing of the dead, and this is what they do not normally see. And our culture tends to separate the two. We have a strange antithesis towards the dead. We have little intimacy with the mortal remains once the last breath is spent. This contrasts sharply with our prehistoric and medieval ancestors, who would often leave their dead lying around in public. Not out of indifference, of course, or forgetfulness, but because they follow different ritual processes with the mortal remains, processes that perceive the dead still to have a role to play among the living before they return to the natural world. They might, for example, have been allowed to rot on a public platform for scavenging before certain bones were pulled out and stored in special commemorative places. Or in the case of the Cheddar Gorge bodies, the bones might be carefully curated and recycled. 
Some individuals, as we have seen, may have been flung into peat bogs as votive offerings or pushed out to sea on a raft. No matter how undignified we might find that today, it was something that society believed was appropriate at the time. Our own contemporary cultural process is equally distinctive. The body is put in a box, the lid is screwed down, and the box shunted out of sight as soon as possible. The body becomes no longer part of the cultural landscape, but the box takes centre stage in ceremonies that leave little in the way of archaeological traces. Now, I live near a natural burial ground, which is often the scene for themed burials, and I'm grateful to Emma Restalord from the Sunrising Natural Burial Ground for allowing me to use these images. The one on the left in particular, which shows a procession and ceremony, a far cry from the somber atmosphere of funerals that I grew up with. And on the right, at the same burial ground, I'm grateful too, too for uh, Julia de Mambro for allowing me to use this image of her husband's funeral. He was a keen cyclist, and on his final journey, his coffin was transported on a specially designed tandem, pedalled by his cycling friends, followed by a cycling cortege. None of this was surfaced in the archaeological record. It shows us how little we really know about prehistoric ceremony, and how, in the absence of grave goods in our own society, how little future archaeologists might know about us. Archaeology leaves us no cortages like this horse-drawn carriage, no burial services, no singing, no liturgical patterns, no understanding of how mourning and respect might have been shown, for example here with firearms, just the physical remains of the end point. Now in modern society, we have lots of ceremony but no grave goods. That said, something approaching grave goods might be interpreted from one exhumation that I undertook where the fill of the grave contained numerous small items of football memorabilia, such as badges and mementos. The incumbent was an avid supporter of a well-known premiership football team, and these items were presumably thrown into the grave by his footballing friends as the grave was infilled. This is an unusual phenomenon for a 21st century context, but something that in, pre in prehistoric times would be viewed by archaeologists as represented, representing a votive offering. Here it reflected the individual's association with a particular football team, and the fact that the living had been involved in the votive process would presumably bring ethnographers to view it as having a tribal connotation. It begs the question as to what nature of footballing pageantry preceded it. Flowers in the shapes of football, scarf waving, singing of a tribal anthem, perhaps something along the lines we see here at our natural burial ground. Once the body has been buried, the grave filled in, the formalities over, and the mourners have left the scene, the ceremony and the ritual are now over too. The thing to remember here is that when a body is placed in a coffin and interred, or placed in a crypt, there is never the slightest intention that it should be brought up again. And nowhere was that more evident than at Christchurch Spitalfields, where from the 18th century onwards, the well-to-do of East London were transported with dignity, ceremony and pomp to their resting place. Once out of sight, however, dignity, ceremony and pomp went out of the window, and the coffins were crammed into available space in sardine-like fashion and heaped up in piles as excavations by Jez Reeve and Max Adams has shown. Any news of the need to re-examine or exhume here would be greeted with some embarrassment. And the same with burials. What indeed of the unscrupulous undertaker who sold a coffin, a solid oak coffin, to a family but sensing they might not know the difference, substituted a cheaper oak veneered chipboard one instead? And spare a thought for the grave digger, who, according to the Burial Act, is obliged to leave a maximum of six inches, 150 mil, gap between one grave and the next. Is this ever checked? No. Does the Ministry of Justice have enforcement officers? No. 
Does it really matter if he makes it less? Well, it does if the body has to be dug up again. Now, as we can see, and I hope we'll see more in a moment, sometimes it's what people think they can get away with. Take as an example the tomb and chantry chapel of Prince Arthur in Worcester Cathedral, as shown here in this early etching. I'm dancing around through time and space. Do you realise this, I hope? I hope you can keep up. Arthur, Prince of Wales, was destined to succeed his father, Henry VII. Whether he would have been Arthur I or Arthur II, I leave to your judgment of whether you believe the other Arthur and whether there was or whether there wasn't a Battle of Mons Badonicus. But let's assume uh, he would have been King Arthur at any rate. As a teenager, Arthur was tasked to defend the Welsh marches and had been married to an equally teenage bride, uh, Catherine of Aragon, to secure a treaty with Spain. Both objectives went out of the window when Arthur, who was a sickly boy, died in 1502. He was only 16. His place was taken by his brother, later to become Henry VIII, and we know all about him. Curiosity shows there are some odd circumstances about Arthur's burial. Firstly, why Worcester? Secondly, why did none of the royal family go to his funeral? He was the eldest son and Prince of Wales. Thirdly, why is there no record of Henry paying for the Chantry Chapel? And fourthly, why do the tombs of Bishop Gifford, who died earlier, and his sister Matilda appear at the bottom of Arthur's monument there? He is, after all, a member of the royal family. Research by the cathedral archaeologist Chris Guy and I noticed that the only iconography pertaining to the Prince of Wales, that's the uh, fleur de lis and the portcullis, and Catherine of Aragon, that's the pomegranate, occurred on the frieze on the south face of the Chantry Chapel. Moreover, the frieze transpired to be of a slightly different geology to the rest of the monument. Furthermore, a ground-penetrating radar survey indicated that the cavity that you can see here in pink, in which the body must have lain, was off-centre to the structure as it currently stands. It struck us that Arthur, despite his status, may have been given a second-hand monument, one already occupied by Bishop Gifford. This was a monument on the cheap. And by using computer graphics to remove the frieze, we have some idea as to how the original pre-Arthur monument might have looked. All that was done was dismantle the existing top, modify the position of Gifford and his sister to allow Arthur some space, and add in a new smart frieze before replacing the top half again. There we are. The authorities must have felt very pleased with themselves with this budget measure but they didn't get away with it. They soon discovered that with the increased height, the monument would no longer fit under the roof arches, which had to be bashed away to make space. Back to inhumations and what you can get away with. The need for screening at exhumations is to apply dignity and preserve them from public glaze. But in those circumstances where the exhumation is part of a police investigation, crime scene protocols apply, and a crime scene tent is more appropriate. As television watchers will no doubt observe, crime scene tents come in standard sizes, typically about three by three meters, which is about the right size for excavating the body and being able to move around inside it. It can be positioned so that any clandestine grave can be examined in the most practical position, but not so in graveyards where projecting headstones and memorials can make it almost impossible to position a crime scene tent at all, yet alone with the grave in the right place inside it. A potential solution for this is to hire in larger, more versatile tents, which tend to be supplied by marquee companies. The one I remember best in a, an exhumation was a tent mostly used for wedding receptions. It was long and rectangular, had two vertical poles projecting through the top, 
to which flags could be attached if required. The side walls were white, but the roof was of green and white stripes, and the whole edifice would have not looked out of place at a medieval jousting tournament or give the impression that the circus had come to town. It did, however, provide cover from prying eyes and paparazzi lenses, but in fact made little difference because workspace was always limited by the closeness of the four graves either side of the one that was being exhumed. Protocols and practicalities are not always good bedfellows. And bizarrely, this wedding tent also supported an internal line of glass chandeliers, as well as a number of other features, including uh, an, an optional air conditioning system. Now, watching exhumations on TV, I was always astonished how well-preserved exhumed coffins seemed to be when they eventually emerged from the screens with the undertakers. Now I know why. The undertakers used a different coffin. Unbeknown to the rest of us, the undertakers sneak in with a new coffin before all the protocols are set in place. But the secret is this. The new coffin is bigger than the old one. This means that the mess from the old one, including its incumbent, can fit comfortably inside. Undertakers then carry it out, all clean and shiny, from behind the screens, allowing a few precious seconds for the cameramen to take their shots as they walk across the Black Ford Transit, equally clean and shiny, labelled Private Ambulance. The flashlights illuminate the scene like lightning strikes. This is part of the ritual, effectively unscripted, but with everyone in theatrical place. But before this can happen, there are problems inside the circus tent. The first thing is the archaeologists are trying to find the edges of the grave. Sometimes the graves are dug laboriously by hand, other times by mini digger. But no matter which way it's done, it's supposed to conform to the letter of the burial act in terms of its depth, six feet to top of coffin, and no less than six inches from the grave next, 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 on each side. But given the pressure on graveyards to cram as many as possible into a finite space, the six inch gap is a guesstimate rather than a measurement. The idea, of course, is to leave a bulk of solid earth between one grave and the next to prevent collapse. Now, because of factors of space, the grave is often dug as narrowly as possible in order to accommodate the maximum number of individuals. But each grave has to be wide enough to lower the coffin in. But did anyone think how difficult it might be to lift it out again. In the example here on the left, the adjacent grave was a slight distance away, permitting a construction of a platform to make life easier. Under normal circumstances, this just isn't possible. And we found the best way to excavate, in fact, the only practical way, was to lie on one's stomach and excavate manually by reaching down into it until it was impossible to reach down any further. At that point, one slid oneself carefully in, keeping one's feet as near to the side as possible so as to minimise any damage until the top of the coffin was reached and one's feet were bent outwards to minimise downward pressure, as shown from on the image on the right, uh, which is uh, one I drew off the internet. Now, this is where it becomes interesting, and I'll describe a typical scenario, but I'm afraid I'm not able to show any images. The coffin is effectively a void, and there's an enormous weight resting on the lid, not just from the soil itself, but also from the weight of water draining in every time it rains. Solid wood retains its stability quite well in wet conditions. In fact, waterlogged wood can reach a stage of preservational equilibrium uh, which is why many ancient wrecks survive underwater. But not chipboard. Chipboard becomes saturated, warped, blisters and disintegrates. And it takes only a relatively short time for a coffin lid to cave in with half a tonne and a half of wet soil sitting on its top. And as it caves in, the sides splay out, or at least splay out as much as they can against the walls of the grave until they either jam themselves tightly or also disintegrate. 
Using them to stand on is hardly ideal, but it's the only option there is. There's also a health and safety issue here, but everyone pretends not to know about it. Standard hole digging guidelines tell you that the sides of a trench must be shored up if the depth of the hole becomes greater than its width. My feet would now be a metre down a hole that is barely 70 centimetres wide, and the point at which shoring kicks in is well past. Shoring, of course, apart from smashing in the sides of the coffin, would also serve to narrow the working area in the grave even more, and reduce the probability of extracting the coffin to nil. Now, from this position, the next step is to expose the surface of the coffin lid and identify the nameplate for ID purposes, assuming it has survived. This needs to be recorded and involves bending double and photographing it. And the next step, for those of you who have worked with police forces, will be so, so predictable. The senior investigating officer, the SIO, We'll look at the image on the nameplate on the camera screen. It'll look at me, then back at the image on the camera, then back to me with a pained expression and the inevitable statement made in a dramatically quavering voice. God, this is the wrong grave. Ha, 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 I will say with a sarcastic smile intended to humour his predictable little joke that he'll be telling at dinner parties for the next decade and we get on with excavating it. Now the coffin lid, albeit collapsed and split, is still sitting on the splayed out coffin and I have to be careful how I move from one end to the other for stability. I can rest my elbows on the ground surface either side so that if it collapses I can hang there with my legs dangling and not join our friend in the coffin. So far so good, it all seems reasonably solid. And we learned from experience that the least unpleasant way of lifting the incumbent was to try and raise what was left of the coffin with the body inside. To pull off the lid and extract body parts in the best articulated way possible, apart from being messy, runs the potential of causing post-mortem damage. Providing we can lift this messed up coffin with the body still inside, any problems or errors can be blamed on the forensic pathologist and not on us. Bending double yet again, legs pressed against the side walls, we take it in turns to clear the soil from the narrow gap between the coffin and the sides of the grave. If the shape of a coffin was a simple rectangle, like a packing case, this would be easier. But coffins traditionally have been either wedge-shaped or have a wider bit that reflects the shape of the body in a supine position. Because of this traditional coffin shape, the space to work in is minimal and it takes a long time to clear out the narrow gap on its four sides. Anyone who thinks that it would be useful to grab the sides of the coffin and hoist it up is sadly naive. The sides would just detach themselves from the base and the contents spill out. Moreover, and a phenomenon that I learnt very quickly, is that the pressure of the soil on the coffin and the general waterlogging that occurs in the bottom of the grave means that the coffin base becomes adhered to the earth it sits on. All the air has been pushed out and it remains glued fast through hydraulic suction. The only way to unstick the coffin base is to release the vacuum from underneath it, allow the air in and separate it from the earth. This is best achieved by groping down at one end into the slime between the coffin side and the grave, feel for the coffin bottom and then squeeze a strap under one end and continually wiggle the strap from side to side in a thawing motion until it can be worked further along the coffin bottom. In doing so, the vacuum is broken, the air gets in, and the coffin is unstuck. It needs at least four, ideally more, wide straps shuffled under from each end of the coffin. The wider the strap, the harder it is to wriggle underneath, but the better support it provides for lifting. Once four wide straps are in place, evenly spaced along the coffin, it's time to get out and move to the next stage. It requires eight people, one on each end of four straps, to hoist the coffin carefully to the surface. It begins to rise unevenly. There is an on on ominous slurping noise as the final part of the vacuum is broken, 
and the coffin lurches down towards one end. It's let down again hurriedly and we adjust the position of the straps to balance it better. Up it comes again, slowly inch by inch, but this time level. But it catches on the grave sides and a trickle of soil splashes its way to the bottom, followed by more clods as the grave wall thinks seriously about collapse. At least the coffin bottom seems to be holding. The trickle of soil from the side has stopped. This is now the delicate part. The coffin is just above the top of the grave, but its sides are heaving uncomfortably, threatening to burst at any moment. It's being held together by the straps. We need to move it sideways to where the undertakers have positioned the new, larger, shiny coffin parallel to the grave. This is easier said than done, and we are impeded at the ends by headstones. Four of us have to step over the new coffin. Meanwhile, two of the four on the other side have to leap into the empty grave in order to move across, then clamber out again, still holding their arms in the air, supporting the weight of the coffin on the straps. But the new, larger coffin has been placed too near the edge, and they become stranded in the grave with insufficient space to get out. The coffin lurches frighteningly towards the empty grave, Fragments of chipboard fall off. One of the CSIs in the grave yells expletives at the others, lets go of his strap and has to support the bottom of the coffin with his hands. We're on the verge of panic. The eight individuals shout ancient eight different solutions to the problem. No one knows what to do next. The undertakers, now grumbling, take the decision to drag the new coffin further back, although it offends their ceremonial sensibility. To their disgust, we have to tread in it and out of it again as we move backwards. The undertakers now start getting stroppy, but such is the confined space between the headstones that no alternative dance movement is possible. Meanwhile, the two CSAs clambering out, TSIs clambering out of the grave, cause a minor avalanche, but manage to escape in time. The coffin, now swinging at various angles as this performance continues, begins to leak. But just before its sides finally give up and disintegrate, we manage to lower it, albeit faster in than intended, into the new coffin. There are shouts of relief all round from everyone apart from the undertakers, who now start to wipe the mud and slime off the woodwork of the new coffin to retain its shiny, bright appearance. This is now our turn, the archaeologist's turn, to sit back and watch the ritual will begin to start formally. The head undertaker checks to see the private ambulance is in position, adjusts his tie, puts on his hat, and walks serenely from the tent across to the van to open its rear doors. This is the signal to the paparazzi that the ritual is about to recommence, a type of standby indicator. The undertaker allows them a minute to take off their lens covers, position themselves appropriately, and wait. He then returns, leading out his colleagues, carrying the new coffin. Cameras whir, flashlights go off, and the coffin is expertly slid into the back of the van as though the last few hours of chaos had never happened. The doors are shut, and it drives away, followed by a police officer on a motorcycle to maintain evidential continuity. Now at the mortuary, the forensic pathologist will pick his way through the remains, attempting to answer the various questions that may have been posed. Identity, toxins, trauma, drugs, whatever. And once concluded, the remains will all be returned to the new coffin. The undertakers will return it to the church and carry it back to the tent with the same solemnity with which they took it out in the first place. The chances are the paparazzi will no longer be there because the event is not newsworthy anymore, but the performance takes place irrespective, and the ritual and the dignity are both maintained. Once inside the tent, however, this will be forgotten for one very simple reason. The new, clean, shiny coffin is bigger than the original one, and there is no chance whatsoever of it fitting back into the same hole. Widening the grave risks almost certain collapse of the narrow columns between our grave and its neighbours. Of course, as archaeologists, We'd already worked that one out. We knew it wouldn't fit. 
but we have long since left, and that is not our problem anymore. Now, I want to conclude with an interesting exhumation, another exhumation that took place in 2008 in the graveyard of a quiet Catholic oratory. The exhumation was instigated by, by no lesser personage than His Holiness the Pope himself. It was to recover the mortal remains of one Cardinal John Henry Newman, a controversial priest of extraordinary um, intellectual energy who died in 1890 and to whose intercession a number of miracles had been attributed. He was to be canonized and his remains transferred to a splendid bespoke marble sarcophagus installed in Birmingham's Catholic Cathedral. Apart from honoring Newman's life and work, this was seen to encourage pilgrimage and the church's mission. It was a win-win situation instigated from the Catholic Church's highest level. But unfortunately, it misfired. Exhumation duly took place in the private oratory in Worcestershire, where the Cardinal had been buried. The terms of the burial act were all adhered to, but as there was no forensic implication, no police presence was necessary. The operation occurred protected from public gaze by screening, and by the tall perimeter wall of the oratory itself. Only those involved in the exhumation knew exactly what went on, and as far as we are aware, there were no archaeologists present. A curious public relations silence followed the event, but a later statement issued by the church's press office gave some surprising news. Although the grave had been fully excavated, Cardinal Newman's remains could not be found. One might be excused for thinking that those involved had dug in the wrong place. But although no bones had been unearthed, the exhumation had conveniently recovered a coffin plate bearing the cardinal's name, a coffin handle, and the tassel from a barita, which is a red square ridge cap with, with peaks, which only cardinals are permitted to wear. This was deemed to be adi adequate evidence that the exhumation, exhumation had identified the correct marked grave. But where was the rest of his eminence? A subsequent announcement from the church's press office pointed out that his physical remains had perished over time. This, the statement continued, was not uncommon in Worcestershire soils, an observation that archaeologists in Worcestershire found rather odd. It was not a phenomenon they'd encountered before in Worcestershire, where human remains cheerfully been recovered from graves dating well back into prehistory, uh, um, much older than the date of Cardinal Newman's personal demise. A national daily tabloid asked my opinion on this, and I replied that it would, be, it would require exceptionally acidic soils to completely erode human hard tissue, and for the sake of scientific curiosity, if nothing else, the church might consider allowing an analysis of the buried soil. The church's public relations office responded to this reasonable scientific suggestion with a resounding slamming of the door. And as a result of this, I and others began to smell a rat. We may have been denied access to the burial soil, but the church had no powers to stop us taking soil samples from the ground immediately outside the oratory. This was the next best thing. There was unlikely to have been any geological difference over such a short distance to the soil inside. An analysis was duly carried out, and the soils in all the samples taken showed it to be moderately acidic, but sufficiently, in, sufficiently in, insufficiently acidic uh, to have caused the total loss, loss of the hard human tissue. More curious still was the fact that the nameplate, the coffin handle, and the Beretta tassel had all survived, but the bone hadn't. From a scientific decay perspective, all three should have decayed well before the human bone, not the reverse. Even in ancient burials, metals and fabrics rarely survive to be found with human bone. This was therefore an unusual scientific turnabout, 
which defied the expected process of taphonomics, not to mention the laws of physics. It was tantamount to announcing the discovery of water flowing uphill. It was also interesting, not to mention suspicious, that two items, the nameplate and the tassel, could be used as strong evidence for this being Carlton Newman's resting place. And the smell of rat became a little stronger. It was only when the tabloid that was running the story did some research that we began to work out what might have happened, aided indirectly by the opinion of the gay rights activist Peter Tatchell. It transpired that Cardinal Newman was believed to have been homosexual, although this was denied, denied by the church press office, and had spent much of his working life with his companion, Brother Ambrose St. John. After the latter's death, the Cardinal requested that when he too should pass away, he should be buried in the same grave as Brother Ambrose in the oratory. The church, ostensibly at least, acceded to his wishes, but were insufficiently aware of the Catholic Church's attitude towards homosexuality in the late 19th century to know whether those wishes were carried out to the letter. There's no doubt that the ceremony that the Catholic Church accorded to its clergy and particularly to its cardinals, would have been carried out in full. But there must be some doubt that the coffin actually contained the body. Those tasked with managing his burial at the time may have felt it better for his salvation, and no doubt their salvation too, to enter him quietly elsewhere but bury his coffin, possibly stone-filled, adjacent to Brother Ambrose as lip service to the cardinal's final wishes. We were not permitted to examine the fill of the grave to see if stones or other material had been used, and the church remained tight-lipped throughout until the controversy died down. A cracking mystery, if ever there was one. It would be interesting to know what the Pope was told of all this. Probably nothing. He arrived on a state visit, part of which involved an outdoor service to announce Newman's beatification probably blissfully unaware of only the surviving nameplate coffin handle and a tassel. Cardinal Newman, presumably lying peacefully elsewhere, was duly beatified in absentia on December the 19th, 2010, and later canonised in absentia on October the 13th, 2019. His few remains are now retained in a small casket in a side chapel at Birmingham Cathedral. Strangely, these remains, according to the Independent Catholic News of 2008, consisted of, I quote, a few locks of hair, a piece of linen thought to be stained with Newman's blood, and the cross of Christ that he wore, none of which had ever been mentioned before. So what had happened to the nameplate, the handle, and the tassel? In the words of Lewis Carroll, Curiouser and curiouser, as Alice said. Thank you. Well, thank you, John, and uh, what an extraordinary note on which to end for this evening. We're now two-thirds of the way through our series uh, and I look forward to greeting you back tomorrow afternoon at two for the last two lectures and the question and answer uh, session with which the lectures will conclude. So until tomorrow at two, may I wish you a safe evening and uh, uh, let's express our th uh, thanks again to John for his excellent performance so far.